Hey everybody, Scott Nicholson with the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation, and I'm real excited about today's talk. Uh, I met Holly Nash at our regional symposium at the end of last year, and uh, she's so passionate about her field of expertise, uh, and that, that really was uh, evident in our conversations together, and uh, so I have been excited to bring her to the series so that she can share all of her knowledge about how diet contributes to your health. So uh, hi, Holly. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Holly Nash. I am a registered dietitian. I'm a certified specialist in obesity and weight management, and I am the nutrition education coordinator for the Emory Bariatric Center in um, Midtown Atlanta. And we are going to spend some time today talking, well, a lot of time talking about how your diet contributes to health. So let's get started. I don't have any dis anything to disclose. We have quite an agenda this afternoon. We're going to start by talking, by reviewing the current state of United States health we're going to compare that to other high income countries in the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. There's a total of 38 countries in that, um, in that group. We're going to then explore the impact that the standard American diet has on human health. We're going to um, consider some of the challenges surrounded, uh, surrounding um, disseminating accurate nutrition information to the public. We're going to highlight several scientific studies that examine the uh, role of dietary and lifestyle habits on our longevity, health, and disease. We're going to discuss the impact of the standard American diet and what it does to kidney health. And then I'm going to introduce the concept of lifestyle medicine and whole person health. So first of all, like I said, thank you for having me here and inviting me to speak on what is the single most important and maybe the most confusing topic today, which is human nutrition. So let's begin by looking at how health and healthcare in the United States compares to that of other similar high income countries who are also members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. These are economically similar countries so we're talking about countries like France, the UK, Australia, and Germany. Now, as you'll quickly notice, although Americans are good at a lot of things, taking care of ourselves is not one of those things. So in 20, sorry, I have to put my glasses on. In 2022, the Commonwealth Fund released updated data comparing the US healthcare to that of 36 other high income countries in the OECD. Here are the highlights. The United States spends more on healthcare as a share of the economy. We spend nearly twice as much as the average OECD country. And yet we have the lowest life expectancy at birth, the highest maternal and infant mortality, and we have among the highest suicide rates. The United States is also the only country in the OECD that doesn't have universal health coverage. Compared to our peer nations, the United States has the highest death rates from avoidable or treatable conditions. And that is because we have the highest rates of people with multiple chronic conditions and our obesity rate is nearly twice that of the OECD average. So how bad is it? Well, according to the Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, over half of US adults have a chronic disease and 40% have two or more chronic diseases. These are conditions like heart disease, type two diabetes and, and chronic kidney disease. These are diseases that result from lifestyle choices. Now this is important because chronic disease is the leading cause of death and disability in the United States at about 70%. What's more is that 90% or approximately 4.1 trillion healthcare dollars are spent every year managing, not curing these chronic diseases. And this number continues to rise. 
people with chronic conditions are the most frequent users of healthcare in the United States. They account for 81% of hospital admissions, 91% of all prescriptions filled, and 76% of all physician visits. But it doesn't have to be that way. Chronic disease is caused by environmental factors, a lack of physical activity, tobacco or excessive alcohol use, and most importantly, our dietary choices. So we have the cure for chronic disease. It's lifestyle change. Unfortunately, and for a myriad of reasons, most Americans prioritize convenience over health. It is estimated that the average American spends 10% of his disposable income on fast food and that processed foods make up close to 70% of the typical American's diet. An additional 25% of the American diet is made up of animal products, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, and processed meats. These foods are our primary source of saturated fat and our only source of dietary cholesterol, which are major contributors in the development of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and stroke. Our love of highly palatable convenience foods is reflected in our rates of chronic disease and preventable death. The dependence on these animal products processed and ultra-processed foods results in diets that are extremely high in added sugar, sodium, and saturated fat. Diets which are very low in the nutrients and fiber that the human body needs to be healthy and to fight disease. This is why we are the sickest nation in the world. So why are we all so confused about how to nourish the human body correctly? It's certainly not due to a lack of nutrition science, which we will see. One of the factors, in my opinion, is inaccurate information overload. There is a lack of diligence around who is providing nutrition information to the public. Social media, popular television shows with their supposed nutrition experts, and millions of dieting books all send conflicting information and keep the public confused. Let's look at an example of that. In a 2020 study published in the Humanities and Social Sciences Communications analyzed the top 100 best-selling nutrition books. These books were evaluated for the claims that they made in their summaries, but also for the credentials of the authors who penned them. The researchers found that the authors' professions ranged from physicians and personal trainers to entrepreneurs and reality TV stars. Only three of the books were written by dietitians. Worse yet, five of the authors were facing legal or professional repercussions for inaccuracies in the content of their books. The researchers concluded that the nutritional recommendations within the books were extremely varied and often in direct conflict with one another. So since we can't depend on nutrition books, television, or social media to provide us with accurate nutrition information, what about our government guidelines? Every five years, the Department of Ag Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services are mandated to update and release the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the DGA. These guidelines are the most widely available and the most impactful nutrition recommendations we have in this country. These recommendations are used to develop, implement, and evaluate all of the federal food and nutrition programs. They are the basis for our national health policies and they guide our nutrition education. In order to create the guidelines, the US government appoints an advisory committee made up of nationally recognized scientific experts in nutrition, 
and medicine and public health. These experts are tasked with reviewing the most current developments in nutrition science and public health. They then create a list of recommendations that's called the scientific report, and they submit this for review. Now, given this information, one would think that the dietary guidelines would be the ideal resource for accurate nutrition information, but it is not. You see, in the United States, after the experts submit the scientific report, the secretaries of agriculture and health and human services reserve a period of time to take what they call public comments. This comment period allows the food industry and other special interest groups to lobby the government and influence public policy to protect their interests. During this period of public comment, the expert committee's scientific recommendations are diluted and oftentimes just outright changed. Therefore, the dietary guidelines for Americans are not only based on scientific and expert recommendations, but they are strongly influenced by interest groups and the food industry. And they have been widely criticized for this. So what happens if we remove that industry influence? Well, our guidelines would look a lot like Canada's. When the Canadian experts were creating the scientific reports for their 2020 guidelines, they excluded any research that was commissioned by industry or an organization with a business interest. Consequently, their plate looks much different from ours. The foods represented are whole grains, fruit, vegetables, and protein-rich plant foods. Because there's no influence from the food industry, meat and dairy are no longer represented as distinct food groups. The Canadian guidelines recommend choosing protein foods that come from plants more often than animal-based protein. And they recommend making water the beverage of choice. So unlike the US dietary guidelines, Canada's guidelines are aligned with science instead of industry. So before we move on to the science, what questions do we have? No burning questions? All right, let's move on to the science. Over the past few decades, there have been a number of scientific studies that exa examining the role of the dietary and lifestyle habits on our longevity, our health, and disease. So we're going to review just a few in order to better understand health promoting versus health harming dietary habits. And we're going to start with the Framingham Heart Study. So the Framingham Heart Study was the first of its kind. And it, it was, was done in 1949, focused on exploring the impact that diet and lifestyle have on coronary heart disease. The study originally included over 5,000 participants between the ages of 30 and 62 from the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. This study proved for the first time that high blood pressure and high cholesterol were in fact major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Now this study is ongoing. It now has over 14,000 participants spanning three generations, and it does continue to study how diet and lifestyle impacts cardiac health in particular. The Oxford Vegetarian Study is a prospective study which included over 11,000 participants that were recruited in the UK between 1980 and 1984. The study compared the health outcomes of 6,000 vegetarians compared to 5,000 non-vegetarians over a period of 12 years. The re research showed that vegetarians had lower all-cause mortality when compared to meat eaters. Those who were eating 100% plant-based diet, so vegans, had lower total cholesterol 
and lower LDL cholesterol when compared to the meat eaters. Meat and cheese consumption were positively associated with total cholesterol, while fiber intake was inversely associated. And mortality from ischemic heart disease was also positively associated with the intakes of total animal fat, saturated fat, and dietary cholesterol, all of which are only found in animal products. The European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, the EPIC study, is an ongoing multi-center prospective cohort study that's designed to investigate the relationship between nutrition and cancer. It involves over 500,000 people across 10 European countries. And these participants have been followed for cancer incidence and cause specific mortality over several decades. Now the EPIC Oxford study used a cohort of vegetarians as a comparison group and found that the overall incidence of all cancers was lower in the vegetarian group than in the meat eaters. They also found that vegans, people who eat 100% plant-based, and lacto-ovo vegetarians, those are vegetarians that include dairy and eggs in their diet, those two groups have 32% less chance of developing cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease than even the most health conscious meat and fish eaters. The Seventh-day Adventists are ideal subjects for large scale health studies. And they've been highlighted in over 300 publications. They're ideal subjects because their religion encourages them to engage in many positive lifestyle behaviors. So they're encouraged to avoid alcohol and smoking completely. They're, they're encouraged to be physically active and to prioritize their spirituality. And they are strongly encouraged to consume a plant-based diet. Now this gives scientists the opportunity to compare health outcomes of members of the same community based upon the, their adherence to the religious recommendations for dietary and lifestyle habits. So in the Adventist Health Study 1 and 2, Adventists who identified as vegetarians or those who are eating a more plant-based diet had lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of incidence of risk factors like hypertension, high cholesterol, and high triglycerides. The vegetarians had lower rates of type two diabetes, lower incidence of cancers, including ovarian, prostate, lung, and bladder cancer. The vegetarians also had less de degenerative arthritis and less soft tissue disorders. In addition, almost all risk factors and disease incidents were further improved in the people who were eating 100% plant-based diets, so in the vegan population, even when compared to those who were lacto-ovo vegetarians. A prospective cohort study of over 131,000 participants from the Nurses Health Study and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study examined the association of animal versus plant protein intake with all-cause and cause-specific mortality. The researchers found higher rates of death from cardiovascular events in participants who were eating more animal protein and significantly less in people eating mostly plant protein. Now substitution of plant protein for the animal protein, especially when they substituted processed red meats was associated with lower mortality, which suggests the importance of the protein source. Participants who were consuming more than 18% of their total energy from animal protein were also shown to be slightly heavier slightly less physically active and consuming more saturated fat and less fiber than people who were consuming only 10% of their total energy from animal protein. 
Interestingly, participants who had the higher plant protein intake also demonstrated other positive health behaviors and had substantially healthier diets overall. Finally, the China Project is the, one of the most comprehensive nutrition studies to date. The China Project studied the impact of dietary habits on health and disease in 6,500 adults from 65 counties across rural China. Nutritional biochemist, Dr. T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University led the study, and he co collaborated with researchers from Oxford University and the Chinese Academy of Preventative Medicine in Beijing. Now in the early 1980s, China represented a unique opportunity because people tended to live in the same area all their lives. And they consumed the diet that was unique to that particular region. So although their diets were um, typically low in fat and higher in dietary fiber, the different regions did differ in how much meat or seafood was consumed. This contrast gave the researchers an opportunity to compare diets that were higher in whole plant foods with those that were higher in animal products. And the researchers found over 8,000 statistically significant associations between the dietary habits and disease. These findings showed that disease rates in populations consuming mostly plant-based whole foods were significantly lower than those in populations consuming even small amounts of animal protein. The researchers concluded that even small intakes of animal products were powerfully related to increases in heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So now, Let's take a look at how this compelling nutrition research has influenced chronic disease prevention recommendations from major medical organizations. We'll start with the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. In their 2019 primary prevention recommendations for cardiovascular disease prevention, the American Heart Association and and the American College of Cardiology recommend that all adults should consume a healthy diet that emphasizes the intake of vegetables, fruit, nuts, whole grains, and lean vegetable or animal protein and fish. They recommend minimizing the intake of trans fats, red meat, processed red meat, refined carbohydrates, and sugar sweetened beverages. The American Diabetes Association 2019 consensus report for the prevention of diabetes recommends plant forward diets for their ability to control blood glucose and to reduce the risk of developing diabetes. They specifically recommend following a Mediterranean diet, a vegetarian or vegan diet, or the DASH diet, which also emphasizes very high intakes of fruit and vegetables. The American Institute for Cancer Research encourages eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. For cancer prevention, they recommend that at least two thirds of the plate should be comprised of whole plant-based foods with animal protein being limited to only one third or less of the plate. So based on the evidence that we have seen so far, what we can conclude, what can we conclude about health promoting versus health harming eating patterns? Well, we've established that regular consumptions of foods high in saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, and sodium are very damaging to cardiac and overall health. So avoiding processed and ultra processed foods, red meat, and especially processed meats would be very beneficial. Replacing those processed food-like substances 
with more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes would naturally increase our intake of antioxidants, phytonutrients, fiber, and water, what our bodies need to be healthy and fight disease. So what is the best diet for kidney health? A short anatomy lesson that I'm sure nobody needs. The kidneys are two highly vascular organs. Highly vascular just means they have a lot of blood vessels. About, they're about the size of your fist and they're located just below the rib cage on either side of your spine. Now the kidneys have a lot of very important responsibilities, including filtering about half a cup of blood every minute to remove metabolic waste, extra fluid, and acid. Your kidneys can control blood pressure and the production of red blood cells. They produce an active form of vitamin D to protect our bone health. They balance the water and minerals in our blood, minerals like sodium, calcium, phosphorus, and potassium, without which metabolic waste products build up and eventually damage all of the other organs. So since we have already established that the standard American diet increases cholesterol levels, increases blood pressure and dam damages blood vessels in the heart and around the body, it is logical to assume that it would also be very damaging to the kidneys. Well, it is. Harvard University did a longitudinal study looking at how dietary choices impact kidney function over time. They took data from the nurse's health study and followed th approximately 3,300 women over the period of 14 years. Now the researchers were looking specifically for the presence of albumin protein in the urine because that is a sure sign that the kidneys are starting to fail. Researchers found three specific dietary components associated with declining kidney function, animal protein, animal fat, and cholesterol, each found solely in animal products. They found no kidney decline associated with the intake of protein or fat from plant sources. Researchers concluded that higher dietary intake of animal fat and two or more servings per week of red meat may increase the risk for kidney damage and that lower sodium and higher intake of beta carotene, which is found only in plants, may reduce the risk for kidney decline. You see, unfortunately, rates of kidney disease and kidney cancer are on the rise, and not all of that is due to people living longer. Much of the rise can be attributed to our high sugar, high fat diets, and the consequential soaring obesity rates. Excess consumption of sugar and high fructose corn syrup is associated with increased blood pressure and uric acid levels, both of which damage the kidneys. Consumption of saturated fat, sodium, trans fat, and cholesterol found in processed foods, fast food, and animal products increase the acid load that the kidneys have to clear, and that potentially damages them in the process. This is why we restrict protein intake for people who have chronic kidney disease, to help prevent further damage to the kidneys and to help the kidneys function for a little bit longer. But as I mentioned earlier, not all protein has the same effect on the kidneys. You see the nitrogenous waste products in animal protein are much harder for the kidneys to eliminate. It puts the kidneys in a, in a state of hyperfiltration or increased pressure. Now that's not a problem if it happens on occasion. But now most of us are are consuming large amounts of animal products, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, and worst of all, processed meats. And we're consuming them multiple times per day, every single day. Now that state of hyperfiltration occurs within just two hours of consuming animal protein. So if you're having it breakfast, 
lunch and dinner, you can imagine what that's doing to the kidneys. However, the equivalent amount of plant protein causes virtually no stress on the kidneys whatsoever. Let's look at that. In a small three-week study of 40 healthy individuals, the researchers compared a plant, oh sorry, a vegetable protein diet, an animal protein diet, and an animal protein diet that was supplemented with fiber. All of the diets provided the same amount of total protein. The researchers found no difference in plasma amino acid levels, but they did find significant differences in how the kidneys reacted to the protein source. The researchers concluded that independent of the quantity of protein, it was the type of protein is crucial to renal response and protein modified rather than protein restricted diets may prove advantageous in the long-term treatment of chronic renal failure. That was a small study. So how about in a larger double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled six-month clinical trial where we had 253 prehypertensive postmenopausal women, the researchers examined how kidneys process soy protein compared to dairy protein. Consistent with multiple previous clinical trials, plant protein was found to help preserve renal function, even in subjects already living with kidney disease. We've highlighted just a few of the studies that are available to help us understand the difference between health promoting and health harming eating patterns. All of the findings show that eating a more plant-based diet results in less chronic disease, increased cardiovascular health, improved control of the cardiac risk factors like hypertension, high cholesterol, high triglycerides. It helps protect and preserve kidney function and improves all overall health and longevity. That is powerful medicine. And that medicine has a name. It's lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is a whole person approach to treating, reversing, and curing chronic disease using lifestyle and dietary changes. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine defines it as a medical specialty that uses therapeutic lifestyle interventions to treat chronic disease chronic conditions, including but not limited to cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes and obesity. Lifestyle medicine provides individuals with a team of medical and ancillary professionals to help address all aspects of their health, nutrition, exercise, the risk of use, the use of risky substances, relationships, stress management and sleep hygiene. It emphasizes education, motivation, support, and self-care to help individuals obtain optimal health. Lifestyle medicine is one of the fastest growing medical specialties today, but it is not new. I'd like to take a moment to give you some background and introduce you to some of our major players. We'll begin with Nathan Pritikin, who was perhaps the first official lifestyle medicine practitioner. He wasn't a doctor or a surgeon, but following his own diagnosis of severe coronary heart disease at 42 years of age, he radically changed his diet and lifestyle in an attempt to save his own life. He was wildly successful and he went on to launch several research projects over the next 25 years. He founded the Pritikin Longevity Center in 1975, and he became world renowned for helping people reverse terminal heart disease through diet and exercise. His program was validated in over 100 studies, and he also wrote several international best selling books on nutrition, exercise, and health. 
Dr. Caldwell Esselstein was a cardiac surgeon and the chairman of the Cleveland Clinic's Breast Cancer Task Force. He reportedly became frustrated with the standard treatment protocol for cancer and heart disease. Patients were being treated with pills and procedures despite the risk and outcome. And this was frustrating because research was already pointing to the American high fat diet as the main contributing factor in the development of heart disease and many of our Western cancers. Using himself and his family as test subjects, he adopted a vegan oil-free diet and monitored the effects that it had on their cardiac risk factors. He went on to publish his international bestseller, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease in 2007. And he has since helped countless patients reverse terminal heart disease through his cardiovascular prevention and reversal program at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute. Dr. Dean Ornish is the president and founder of the nonprofit Preventative Medicine Research Institute, and he has published multiple research studies correlating lifestyle and dietary habits to health and disease. He has also developed several integrative programs over 35 plus years, including his most recent lifestyle modification program for reversing heart disease. It's called Undo It. Dr. T. Colin Campbell is the nutritional biochemist who led the China Project in the early 80s. And he subsequently co-wrote the China study, Startling Implications for Diet, Weight Loss, and Long-Term Health. He has authored many other books and over 350 research papers focused on the association between diet and disease, particularly in the field of cancer. He's been dedicated to the science of human health for over 60 years and he has actively participated in the development of national and international nutrition policy. And Dr. Michael Greger is a physician, author, and founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He's an internationally recognized speaker on public health issues and a proponent of, health, of the health benefits of following a plant-based diet. This is because his grandmother was one of Nathan Pritikin's original patients and one of his miraculous success stories. As Dr. Greger tells the story, at 65 years old, his grandmother was confined to a wheelchair with crippling angina and terminal heart disease. She had been given just a few months to live when she enrolled in the groundbreaking Pritikin program focused on whole food plant-based diet. She and other death door patients made a full recovery and she eventually died at the age of 96. Dr. Greger donates all of the proceeds from his numerous speaking engagements, books, and DVDs to charity. His nonprofit organization, nutritionfacts.org, is the first science-based non-commercial website that provides free videos and articles on all the latest finding in nutrition science. It is a phenomenal resource. I highly recommend it. There are also a number of programs available to help support individuals who are looking to improve their health and to re reverse their chronic conditions using the concepts of lifestyle medicine. As I I mentioned Dr. Ornish has a program called Undo It, which has been scientifically proven to reverse heart disease. It is also the first integrative lifestyle program of its kind to be covered by Medicare. The Pritikin Longevity Center is now a luxury wellness retreat in Miami, but it continues to apply the principles of lifestyle medicine to improve the health of its participants through education and dietary changes. The Complete Health Improvement Program, now known as PIVIO, is another proven lifestyle intervention program that I am intimately familiar with. I'm a trained facilitator and have run multiple groups during my time at Emory. This is a 12-week lifestyle intervention program that's taught in a community setting or healthcare setting by trained volunteers. This program has helped tens of thousands of participants improve their health through education, lifestyle and dietary modification. If you are interested, there are a number of document 
documentaries that have been released over the years that highlight the realities of our current food system and how it impacts human health and the health of our planet. This is just a short list, there are many more. So please take the time to watch one or two. You'll be very surprised by what you learn. All right, to wrap up and summarize. In this session, we have seen that there is an overwhelming body of scientific and medical literature that supports the theory that our daily habits and actions have an enormous impact on our short-term and long-term health. We've underscored and explored the profound effect that our dietary habits have on both developing and in most cases, reversing chronic diseases, including coronary heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and some forms of cancer. We've seen how the concept of reversing chronic conditions through lifestyle modification has crystallized and formalized into the field of lifestyle medicine. So I hope that the information provided today has helped to educate, inspire, and empower you. I hope that you walk away with the understanding that we are all capable of improving our health by changing the small decisions that we make every day. And finally, I want to ensure you that there is a network of people and providers available to educate, motivate, and support you on your journey to optimal health. Thank you very much for your time. I'll take any questions now. Uh, thank you, Holly. This was just filled with fantastic information. I, I do feel guilty about eating my Italian sub sandwich now. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, need to, I need to have healthier habits here. Um, we, we had some praise in the chat from Deb about this is a really powerful talk. And then she was bragging that she's in Canada and they have the, they have, uh, no, she wasn't bragging. I'm just teasing. Um, <clears throat> She, she asks if you could please talk about any evidence that the nutrition uh, and that nutrition affects brain health in regards to keeping sharp as we age. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm, I think what we've seen from the research that we've studied across the board is that the standard American diet destroys our vascular system, right? And the brain is incredibly vascular. Your, your brain, the biggest consumer of glucose is the brain. Mm. And glucose is found in fruits and vegetables, right? If you consider that over 99% of the American population does not meet the minimum requirements for fiber, that means that 99.9% .9 of the American population is not eating fruits and vegetables. So they're not feeding their brain. Fruits and vegetables bring down inflammation, which also helps brain health. So although I can't quote from any brain specific research, I can assure you that veg the more plant-based diet you consume, the better off your brain health will be. Wow. Uh, general question for us all, what is the best way to get started what can we do today, this week, this month, et cetera? Um, I know for me, I could have picked up a salad instead of my Italian sub, but, <laughs> um, but what else? So here's the thing, right? This is, and this is what I tell all of my patients. Nobody's trying to set the world on fire, right? We're all wherever we are on the, on the, on the, our trajectory. So the idea isn't to stop eating Italian subs today. The idea is to first become aware of our habits, right? Think about yesterday. How many times did you eat animal protein, right? How many times did you eat processed meats? I don't know if everybody knows what processed meats are, right? Your deli sub, your Italian sub, full of processed meats. Yep. Processed meats are bacon, sausage, turkey bacon, turkey sausage, deli meats, salami, bologna, all of those processed meats, they are <laughs> carcinogenic. We know this. There's plenty of research. They're full of nitrates and sodium and fat and horrible things. So getting back to it, 
become aware of your habits, your dietary habits, and then start making small changes. The idea is to move in the direction of improving your health, which means moving towards eating more plant-based and eating fewer animal products. So an easy start is maybe you don't have eggs for breakfast. Maybe you have oatmeal instead, right? Maybe you don't opt for that sub sandwich. Maybe you have sandwich made with whole meat instead, right? Rotisserie chicken breast as opposed to, and not the sliced kind in the deli department, the kind that you buy the breast and you cut it yourself, right? So anytime that you are increasing your fruits and vegetables and decreasing that portion of meat, you're doing your body good. So take your time, move just small improvements a little bit every day. That would be my recommendation. It's good advice. Uh, Sherry Mills uh, says, great presentation. How do you feel about inflammatory diets that are so popular? I know for myself, inflammation is a big problem for me. Um, inflammatory diets like, uh, like mine of wanting pasta and uh, I've been on a, I got a walk last month and I've been making ramen noodles and Asian dishes and, uh, and uh, maybe I don't need to eat so many noodles. Right. So um, we get, so here's the thing. The only way to bring down inflammation in the human body is to eat fruits and vegetables, right? Inflammation is the root cause for every single chronic disease known to man without exception, right? And so knowing that and knowing that our standard American diet is high in all of those products, like it is the most inflammatory way you can eat is consuming massive quantities of animal products. The reverse of that is eating mostly plant-based foods. That's an anti-inflammatory diet. That's how you reverse disease. That is going to bring down inflammation in your body. And it only takes two weeks to feel much better. So just start increasing your fruits and vegetables. Every meal, every snack, make it the biggest portion, right? Did that answer your question? Well, she's responding. Uh, Heather okay. asks, uh, what about lunch meats? Does that have nitrates? Is that any better? Unfortunately, um, lunch meats are the same as the deli meats. Uh, all of it has preservatives and terrible things in them for us, no matter how addicted to them we have become. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so all of those processed meats, all deli meats, including boar's head, like all of those meats are going to be harmful for your health. And so if you're, like I said, if you're going to have a sandwich, get a rotisserie chicken or grill some chicken yourself and use that for your sandwich as opposed to those processed meats. It's a better choice. It's still meat, but it's a better choice. Mm -hmm. If anyone missed any part of today's presentation, uh, we will be posting it on our website and our YouTube channel on the 20th. So in just a, just about, uh, see, it's a, just under two weeks. Uh, and, um, and Holly, if anyone happens to have any questions, oh, Here's another one from Sherry. Uh, um, can you have gluten-free breads on inflammatory diet? Is, di is dairy considered highly inflammatory? And what about eggs? Yes. So gluten-free bread is not going to make any difference for you if you're not gluten sensitive. A lot of people are gluten sensitive just because of what we're doing to wheat nowadays. Um, so gluten-free, if it makes you feel better, that's great. Eggs and dairy, highly inflammatory. They're animal products. They're going to be highly inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory diets are diets that are mostly plant-based. Anytime you include meat, dairy, or eggs, you are inflaming your body. So small amounts, but here's, let me just make, make this very simple. We did not evolve eating the way we eat today, right? human beings evolved on the planet. We're, this is just an organism, right? The body that we live in is just an organism. And it evolved on the planet the same as every other organism. We did not evolve eating processed meats, eggs every day, that kind of thing, right? We were hunter gatherers. So although our food system is radically changed and run by food scientists now, the human body doesn't recognize those highly processed foods. 
because it can't metabolize them pro properly. They cause disease because our body just needs what it evolved on, mostly plants. You know, back in the day, we were really lucky if we caught a rabbit. So if you're having meat a couple times a month, it's no big deal. But every single meal, every single snack, then you're damaging your body. Does that make sense? Thank you so much, she says, and I echo those um, that comment. Um, well, my, you've been so gracious sharing your time with us today, Holly. If anyone has any uh, questions, can uh, they, can we reach out to you later to get answers? Please email me. I put both of my email. I, sh I can share my screen again. I put both of my email. Um, and you have my email, Scott. Yes. So yeah, I put up my personal and my work email. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll provide you with a phone number if you need to call me. Like, yes, absolutely. I'm, a, I'm available. It's such a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure is ours. Thank you so much, Holly. And thank you for everyone who showed up today. Um, again, we'll be posting this in a, just, over, just over a week and a half. Um, and uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks so much, yes. Holly. You have a, talk to you soon. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.